are you a guy that cares at all about uh, the awards? Because uh, the Oscar nominations came out this week. You're, are, are you a guy that pays attention to that at all? Uh, I, knowing that I will never be nominated for anything, <laughs> I kind of, like, you know, th- this year's, like, I'm not a movie snob at all, but, like, every year, the movies that get nominated drift farther and farther away well, I thought I thought Power of the Dog was a bore, man. Like I, I thought it, I thought it was genuinely boring. The, the ones of them that I've seen that were nominated, I thought West Side Story was great. Like yeah. I didn't want to see it. Uh, then I I put in the screener and I thought it was amazing. But I'm not really an awards guy. I never watch award shows. Um, yeah. Not super into it. I usually sort of disagree with the winners. Yeah, you you get you'd get along with uh, Dave great <laughs> yeah. Ben because yeah he he's uh, he hates awards. We do a movie podcast and I'm like you know what Ben this was like two or three years ago I'm like I just don't give a shit about these anymore. We would even do shows highlighting movies. Um, but yeah, I I kind of agree with you is that they're, the movies are kind of drifting away from me. And uh, I got to tell you, my, my wife and I saw, I don't know if you saw Nightmare Alley or not. My wife and I saw it. We both walked out of there thinking, this thing sucked. <laughs> it starts so good. Like yeah. the, it, it, the, the first like 20 minutes, I was yeah. so down. I loved the look. I loved him. I thought it was great. Yeah. And then when the plot kicks in, <laughs> it goes off a cliff. Like, like, it really you know, did. like the script was terrible. I, I'm just bad. Like when I look at the, the nominees, I'm just... I'm baffled. You know, a lot of times I'm baffled. Like sometimes I'm like, yeah, I guess I could see some people like that movie, but yeah. yeah Nightmare. Yeah, I thought that movie was terrible. It started so <laughs> well too. Yeah, it did. The last was, couple. Go ahead, Dave. No, I just, you sort of figured out where the movie was going and then it was like an hour just waiting for it to happen. And anyway, so yeah. Really yeah. It's uh yeah. The last couple of years of movies that, yeah, just been, uh, it's like, really, these are up for awards, but yeah. What, what are you going to do? Yeah. I, I, I used to be huge into it and yeah, the last yeah. few years I've just been not caring. So, uh, but, uh, but anyway, which I was, I was me, sorry, just one quick thing, which makes me now, I get suspicious now because we used to go by, okay, well this movie won, uh, you know, you go back through the years, this movie won best picture, it had best actor. I'm like, was it, are, were people thinking the same things we're thinking now that none of these movies, you know, and I, I think those ones do stand the test of time. I don't think 30 years from now, people are going to be caring about Nightmare Alley, but it does feel, I start getting that weird feeling like, you know, did they mean something more years ago than they do now? Or is it just our perception? I don't know. It's a funny feeling. I guess they made less movies back then and there were there was less variety of movies back then. So if you made a standout movie, it was standing out from a bunch of movies that looked exactly like, you know, uh, Roman Holiday, you know, and then like every single other movie was like a slightly not as good version of Roman Holiday. (laughs) You know, like, but it was, but now it's so diverse and like all the movies are so different that maybe, but I can't imagine in a hundred years, they're going to look at Shape of Water and be like, that is a masterpiece. You know, that film is absolutely that was the best movie made that year you know i fell asleep to that movie twice both times trying to watch it i passed out <laughs> well it's funny where yeah that's two uh guillermo Guillermo uh, del toro movies i'm not even gonna try to say his first name yeah, I don't think two I'm gonna, del toro I don't think movies <laughs> that uh, we're talking about nightmare alley and that and it's like i'm a fan <laughs> of his he yeah should get somebody else to write his scripts right you know? like, yeah like, like crimson peak is the mm-hmm. biggest train wreck it looks so great and it's like a horrible three-hour music video without a song and and it's but it looks so good and you're just like fuck i wish he would get somebody to write his movies Uh like because if man would like when he nails it he nails it but it's it's been a few decades, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. I uh, I was talking with Harlan Williams the other day, and uh, he, he, you know, he doesn't care about awards either. And he was, you know, saying like, but he used to like, you know, when he was coming up in the biz, like aspire to like, you know, maybe, maybe I can win an award someday. Was that ever in your head when you started to get into this? But you, you know, uh, I know you were more comedy and improv yeah, they and all that ignore, they always ignore comedy yeah like, and, 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 I, and i always started but i that was never on my radar you know i started as a sketch comedian so we were right punk rock and like we wanted to be on you know the new snl more than right academy award-winning movie and that was never like I, i'd never resented it or like thought that i would try for it and fail it just was never on my radar yeah at all in any way 
And when it comes down to it, like awards, that doesn't mean a movie is good or bad. Like that's just, you know, the voters said, oh, this is what's nominated. But it's like people need to learn not to take that as like, oh, my movie didn't get nominated. You know, I must have sucked. But no, you like what you like and just move on. You know, it's like it's all subjective. You're not going to please everybody. It's all subjective. Yeah. I mean, I think that you could like lists of that people say my favorite film yeah. great i like hey, that's great that's very handy to know i know who you are that's right yeah film yeah but when you say best it's like what the what does that mean like <laughs> yeah. like, like this, is, this is the best painting like what the fuck like yeah, it yeah. <laughs> like it doesn't mean anything like all these lists of 100 best of this it's just so yeah arbitrary it's, like, it's art it's up yeah. to your taste you exactly. might like your racer head. You're not wrong if you like it. You know, yeah. it's great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just like, yeah, that's why I've yeah, just been kind of turned off of it. It's just like, I'm just going to, you know, enjoy what I enjoy. If it wins an award, cool. If not, I'm still going to enjoy it just as much. But uh, uh, speaking of, you know, uh, you know, you're, you started an improv and everything. I, I can't find anywhere. Uh, I'm sure if I dug deeper, but the state you were part of. <laughs> if I did who, more than five minutes of research. <laughs> yeah, if I did more than five, five minutes, minutes of research. for me. Yeah, that's exactly. Enough. Like, uh, who who started the state? Like, who who originated that? We were a college comedy group at NYU. We 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 met as freshmen in 1988, uh, and Todd Hollebeck was in the old comedy group there called the Sterile Yak, which was started by Mo Willems. Which, if you have kids, you know who he is because he writes like a thousand kids books a day. He writes like "Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus" and like, uh, but he started a comedy group, and Todd wanted to start his own group. And so he put up flyers. Do you want to be in a new sketch group? And at that very first meeting, 20 people showed up and 11 of them ended up working together for 40 years. Like that very first meeting, like Jan, uh, uh, Mike Black, Kerry Kenny, David Wayne, Michael Showalter, Michael Black, like everybody showed up for a flyer. And oh, wow. Up, <laughs> it, crazy. And then we, we did it in college And then after college, we started on MTV and we've all worked together in like bits and pieces for, you know, four four decades, which is pretty crazy. Yeah. You're old, right? I'm super, (laughs) super fucking old. I'm super, super old. (laughs) Man, yeah, that's, uh, no, but that's great. Yeah, that you guys, yeah, are still doing stuff, still, you know, still, yeah, still around and still, you know, relevant. And it's just Everybody's crazy. Everybody's still alive. It's, nobody, yeah. did, nobody, like, it's, it's insane that it's 11 comedians that have lived that long is, is that's against the odds, I would say. <laughs> is, is there any uh, uh, bitterness uh, from anyone that, you know, you see some of them might have been more successful, some of them might have been not so successful? Do you ever see any, you know, bitterness like that, like, or jealousy? There was, but we've burned through it. Like, yeah. uh, like in the 90s, yeah. we all kind of split up. There was a lot of blaming each other for why that we broke up. There was blaming each other for why we didn't do better. You know, we like, uh, but that's all. Now everybody's like old and we're just buddies now. So, but there was, there was about 10 or 15 years where certain factions weren't speaking to each other, but now everybody's it's, it's all good. It's been a, it's been a long, a long, uh, a lot of water under the bridge. <laughs> That's great. We Love seem very it. well adjusted. We've had uh, a number of comedians on here and sometimes you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> you seem like yeah. a pretty, pretty normal guy. Ben. <laughs> Dan, I'm not yeah. a comedian. Stand up, sir. Yeah. Uh, He's a not a comedian. Stand-up comedians are batshit crazy, uh, <laughs> but I, so I'm a writer. You know, I'm a screenwriter more than yeah. that. But but a lot of comedians are really, really, really nuts, and and a lot of them court that. Like a lot of them, they think that if they become less nuts, that will tamp down on what makes them funny. Like mm-hmm. I know John Cleese said that when he went to therapy, it ruined him as a writer and he never wrote anything good again after he went through therapy and like oh, dealt wow. with his demons. Wow. But yeah, a lot of stand-ups have issues. Yeah. I don't have the energy. I don't have the energy to have issues. Yeah, because the the writing is the therapy, right? I mean the right the you know that's the it's an outlet for sure. You know, yeah. it's 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 great. And it's also it's the greatest combination for me at least, because you get to be alone and not dealing with other crazy people but you're also working at the same time so it's it's the best like you sit at your computer and 
play make believe in your head and that's your fucking job. So it's right. the luckiest thing in the world. It's, it's great. Oh, no, sure. Definitely. And, uh, now I, I you know, we're obviously going to get, get to the movie, but, uh, this is something I'm sure you've talked your ass off and are sick of talking about it. But, um, I do just want to know, you know, what the genesis of Reno 911 was like, how did, uh, when did that first, like, when did that idea come to everyone's head and like, how did we that did, start? It was a, it was a failed sketch show. We, we did, a um, from after Viva Variety, which was the show after the state we got a, a deal to develop a pilot at fox and we did a sitcom that that tested really well and then nobody liked it uh and then after that we did a straight up sketch show and so we auditioned everybody for the sketch show and we in that audition we got carlos cedric uh and Nisi all for yeah. a sketch show and so they brought in like a, um, imitations and sketch characters and we met them that way. And then we did a table read of about 30 minutes of sketches and we could feel the pilot die at the table read. Yeah. Like, like, like you could see it just wasn't getting any laughs and people were like, well, the executives were whispering to each other. And one of the things they said was you guys are way too old to have a sketch show. <laughs> and this was 30 years ago. Like, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and they said, no, 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 we can't, we don't want to do it. But we'd already hired a director. We'd already spent money to build sets. And so we only had about like $500,000 left. And we oh, knew wow. we could either go forward with this sketch show that we know is not going to happen, just like a total futile act, or we could come up with another idea. And they let us come up with another idea. And the other idea, Tom said, like, what if we just did a cops parody? We were supposed to be on Saturday night right after cops. That's when we were supposed to air. Yeah. And so we said, let's do a sketch show and shoot it like <laughs> cops. And we had like two weeks. It was all improv because we didn't have time to write it. So we just came up with scenarios <laughs> and we did the pilot and in the editing of the pilot, originally the pilot was this is super long and boring. The, no, the cops were it. just sort of going to be the inner, the, like the Terry Gilliam cartoons and Monty Python. They were just going to sort of be the links that get you from one sketch to another. Sure. And you follow the cops and you go into a trailer and then in the trailer would be this funny sketch. Um, but the sketches, and we did that, and the sketches weren't nearly as funny as the cops. Like the cops just kind of talking to each other in their car and like bullshitting was so much better. And so in the editing room, we cut out all the sketches and it ended up being like cops. And it yeah. is remarkably similar to what the show is now. Uh, and we then Fox passed like Fox, all the young executives loved it. All the old executives hated it because yeah. the main character that was gay mostly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and three it sat on the shelf from 1999 until 2003 when comedy central picked it up. Man. Uh, and so, yeah, you never know. Like, you, you just, it was pure, weird happenstance and luck and really funny people that accidentally made a great cop show. Like, we didn't audition Nisa right. or, or Carlos to be cops, but their cops were just great. Yeah. And that was an accident. Total That's accident. Hilarious. And it, it seemed, I mean, you you totally just own the role of uh, Deputy Junior, uh, Travis Junior, to be exact. Uh, did, did you have any desire to be a cop when you were younger? Because it seems like you just love wearing that uniform. And I got pulled over by, I'm from Tennessee, and I got pulled over a lot. Like, uh, oh. I was a punk rock kid. I had, yeah. a, I had a black mohawk. And this is in, like, Farragut, Tennessee in the 80s. So, like, people hated me. And yeah. I got in my car at a Datsun that was covered with spray paint. Uh, that people would write shit on my Datsun. Uh, I would carry spray paint in the back, and people would draw, like, anarchy symbols and shit all over the car. So I got pulled over a lot. And so, uh, like, in the first couple of seasons, Travis Jr. is basically an amalgam of every cop that pulled me over in high school, <laughs> basically. Uh, and then he sort of took off from there. I love it. That's great. Yeah. And uh, I, I mean, obviously, I, you know, I, I sense a slight, you know, Tennessee accent, but you obviously exaggerate it more for uh, uh, Travis, which, yeah, just totally just adds to the, yeah, the, that, that kind of cop. And it's, yeah, just, uh, yeah, 
great. And uh, I I thank you for the many years of joy you've brought me. So <laughs> it's um, fine. And we have more coming out. They just dropped. Yeah, I know. Yesterday. That's yeah. Uh, so now I can talk about it. But we have new ones that start on February 25th. Uh, a whole new season, never been shown, full length episodes. They're Excellent. fucking great. They're and, they're great. They're as good as we've ever done. St- um, still on Quibi, right? Or it's on Roku. It's Roku. On Quibi. Okay. Quibi. We did a season for Quibi, and then we they, they we did so well they bought a second season for Quibi, and it was a twelve day shoot. And Quibi went under mm-hmm. day three of a twelve day shoot. Like we were mid shooting, and the whole everybody the whole crew is like on their phones reading about how Quibi has just gone under. Katzenberg announced no more Quibi. Yeah, uh, but we were owned by Viacom uh, and just distributed on Quibi. So Viacom gave us the money and let us finish the season. And that is the season that is now airing in like okay. three weeks. Gotcha. Um, and it's everybody. It's the whole cast. It's got like Weird Al. It's got oh. like Lo- Lopez is back as our mayor. Uh, Weird Al Yankovic. Jamie Lee Curtis is in it. It's oh, great. nice. Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's That's... really, it's as good as we've ever done. It's really Are funny. they Full length episodes, full yeah. length regular old Reno's. Because awesome. we knew doing it, Quibi was gone, so we didn't have to shoot Quibi links, and we didn't yeah. have to do that turnstile thing. So yeah. we could, it, so mid game, we we're like, oh great, like we can let it breathe. Let's make this into an episode. Like we were able to kind of refigure it out on our feet. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, they're great. They're yeah. so good. Can't wait for that. So how how um how are we? Uh, speaking with someone in a background in comedy uh, in sketch comedy, Reno nine one one. How how are we about to talk about Casablanca? Um, what what <laughs> what what what? Uh, why 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 this movie? Which I'm thrilled that uh, it was it was part of one of your choices. And um, but uh, why 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 this movie from a comedy Casablanca guy? <laughs> is one of the rare classics that's actually fucking great. Like, like, it, yeah. like it, it's, it's so good. And it's one of those movies that, and I don't know if people still like, I'm old, so I don't know if people still talk about Humphrey Bogart and Casablanca the way, you know, they used to, but it's a movie that I wish people could see it, not knowing anything about it. Like, I right. wish you, like seeing it in a class about how fucking great Casablanca is sucks. Like it'd be, it's, it's would be so much better if it's just late at night and you find it and, watch it it's one of those movies that it holds up in every way and it's got one of the best endings of any movie in history and unfortunately most people know the ending before they watch the movie yeah and so, and like and, and so you you miss like if you so if you've never seen Casablanca stop don't watch this Go watch Casablanca and yes. then watch this. Like, like if yes. you can go into Casablanca not knowing the ending, it's one of the most satisfying films because most movies, you know what the ending's going to be. Like, you don't know how Bruce Willis is yeah. going to beat Hans Gruber. You don't know how <laughs> Luke is going to gonna win, but you know he's going to win. Yeah, like, exactly. Like, like yeah. Casablanca, you really, really don't know what's going to happen until it does. And it's yeah. one of those moments of just like, oh, wow. Like, if you, if you could really manage to see Casablanca not knowing what it's about it's just great and it's it's so entertaining it's so well written it's it's like there's movies like Psycho everybody sees the shower scene of Psycho yeah and they think oh well I mean that's okay that's I guess at the time that was interesting but what they miss is if you've never seen Psycho and if you don't know that shower scene is coming Again, if you if you've never seen Psycho, don't yeah. listen to this. <laughs> like, but if you if you manage to watch Psycho and they kill Janet Lee, the main character, twenty minutes into the movie, and when you're watching it, it's just like, oh fuck! Like, like yeah. you follow this lead character on basically a heist movie, and then they murder her. Like, right. it, it's so shocking. Yeah. Like, well, it, Casablanca well, is. It's, it's there's so many wonderful things to 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 know about the making of the movie. But it's also, it's just all these great, ama- uh, amazing character actors at the top of their form. It's like the kind of movie that almost couldn't be made now for so many reasons. And one of them is huge stars are in that movie. Like Sidney Greenstreet only has like two scenes. 
Like, yeah. you know, they, like, like it's a movie like that it, it would be so hard to make today because almost everybody in the movie was a huge movie star at the time. The guy that opens the door to the casino is the lead in so many gangster movies. Right. And it's just, it's great. Yeah. It's, it's so, it's just a wonderful introduction to that era of movies. Yeah. And, and it's funny that you mentioned Psycho. I think the most controversial uh, part of that scene is, um, or part of that movie is, uh, it was the first movie to feature a toilet. Um, and that was like, that was, that, that was a no, no. <laughs> I was like, ew, a toilet. We can't, we can't show this. We cannot show this on. Can't show on, them, can't talk about Yeah. Them. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of uh, my wife and I watched uh, Being the Ricardos, and there was that whole controversy about they, they had to have the bed separated in the in the bedroom. It's like, yeah, you know, I don't know what level of morality you know denies that a married couple sleeps in their own in the same right. Bed. Yeah, it's so strange. And if you if you read the the, Hay, the Hayes production code, yeah, like the the rules of it are fascinating. It's worth <laughs> a read. It's like ki- couples can kiss. They can't be in a bed together unless one foot is on the floor, <laughs> which is really weird. And like a kiss can't last for more than like four seconds. And that's why, like in a lot of movies, especially like Albert Hitchcock movies, they like mm, 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 they kiss these little yes, short kisses, right, yes. which is really great. And it's much more like you kiss your wife. And, and it's right. But it's like these ways to kind of get around the code. But like the Hayes production code is so weird and interesting and if you see the have you ever seen the original tarzan the ape man or tarzan and his bride i, I mean i think i've seen it like bits and pieces on tv one time but full nudity full nudity it's yeah before, it's before the hayes production code and jane gets naked and, naked. and not just like kind of naked right she, like tarzan her clothes rip off and she swims for like this three minute scene of like full everything and it's right. beautiful it's like this gorgeous under and you're like wow and it's like 1933 and i guess the code came in right after tarzan oh. <laughs> and so it's like so fascinating like, like now you can we, do anything yeah we, we can't have uh boobies anymore so we, we gotta uh <laughs> we gotta we gotta make this coast you yeah we can't show her boobies guys <laughs> exactly like, uh dave before you have to drop uh, what, what what thoughts did you want to mention about casablanca um, casablanca I, sorry I, I long a short a i don't know but i think i think it's a fan, it well i think the thing i like one of the things I like the most is is the setting in Morocco. I think that just takes you out of anything you any I don't know the way it places it. It's sort of a World War II movie that's not, and you're in this sort of like faraway magical place where almost anything can happen, and then all these characters sort of converge because of the like forces outside of themselves, uh, even with. Uh, people having to confront you know their past and then how do, how do you move forward there's ethical dilemmas uh there's personal dilemmas there's you know what's best for me versus what's best for others you know the think something bigger than myself uh, and it all comes together perfectly there's lots there's there's lots of funny moments lots of heartfelt moments um it's an unforgettable film and i would yeah for anyone who's not seen it um please go see it <laughs> it, it yes. does suck man that <laughs> things do get spoiled that things get parodied like on the simpsons or all over the place that people have oh i've already, i already know what that movie's about when all they've really heard is a uh, uh, you know maybe two lines from it that which like completely colors their perception of the film um i absolutely love it i wish i had more time to talk about it but a uh, great choice and uh, <laughs> have a good rest of the podcast <laughs> thanks dave <laughs> <laughs> um but uh but yeah there's so much to this too yeah like they it's not just uh i mean like you mentioned you know about it being a world war ii movie but not a world war ii movie it's kind of the backdrop but it's definitely a huge you know uh a huge part of the movie i mean without I world think war you ii need to know like i think going into it you need to know basic high school level world war ii like i think you, yeah. you need to you, you need to know uh, you don't need to know what every battle was in the battle of bulge and who the generals are but you needed to know you need to be able to understand what it would be like to be in north africa like bef- right before Pearl Harbor and right. understand the weird sort of diplomatic place that the Moroccans were in, which is basic, but it, it allows you to have Nazi bad guys, which, yeah, I mean, I think if, 
Steven Spielberg has taught us anything. It's the Nazi <laughs> bad guys are like the fucking best bad guys you can have. Right. Because you can shoot them and it's great. Nobody cares. You don't need sure. to know his life story to know shoot the Nazi and that's fantastic. Like, so if you have like a basic understanding of, of 1940 North Africa, like yeah. that's all you really need to know going into it. Uh, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, so that they, the movie was made, like America entered the war in like December of of forty two, yeah, and they for, bought yep. the rights of that movie like right then, and the movie right. came out in like November of forty two. Yeah, so like they 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 like they they came out with that movie right as we were entering World War Two, right? And yet they said it before we were in World War Two, so they could kind of make it like a moral conflict and make it a little bit more interesting. Uh, it's also amazing that. I think they bought the rights of the play in January and the movie was done in November, which yeah. is crazy. So like, like, like 11 months from like purchasing the, the, the play to writing it, to producing it, to editing it in 11 months, like just shows you this like factory that Warner brothers was at the time. Yeah, Fascinating. definitely. And, and then you, you get, you know, the performances you get from Humphrey Bogart and Inger Bergham. And it's just in, in insanity that, yeah, they had such a short period of time and yet they still are able to <laughs> just have these iconic, you know, performances. And it's just, but yeah, I mean, it's, there's just so much in this movie. It's not only about the war, you, but then it's, it's a love story. It's about, you know, the, the, the whole just him seeing, um, uh, at, uh, Ilsa, Ilsa, not Ilsa, uh, Ingrid, yeah, Ingrid Bergman. Yeah. yeah, we'll 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 just call her Ingrid Bergman. Uh, uh, but uh, I forget the character's name. But um, uh, but yeah, you know, she, she shows up, and you know, it's just like you you see the pain in in Humphrey's eyes, and it's just like, okay, it's it's this type of movie now. Okay, you know, now we're now we're feeling this. We're not just you know worried about him like just saying you know I'm not I don't stick my neck out for nobody. You know, okay, I'll keep these papers. I know people want to these refugees want to get out and get their visas so they can, you know, be safe. And it's just, yeah, just so much going on until you get, yeah, the, the love story part, but then other stuff continues to happen too. You know, it's, uh, it, it's, yeah. It's, it's like, it's one of the many great things about it. I mean, it, it's people try to emulate so many things about Casablanca, like every studio executive, Ma, I mean, like, in, there's some version of Rick in every note you get about what you want your lead character to be in a movie, which is a super perfect, awesome movie star character who, for some reason, has something in his character that's preventing to be the hero of this situation. Yep. And then suddenly that thing happens that changes him from the hero, from a hero that's being held back to the hero of the situation and, and Casablanca achieves it perfectly. Like he's this awesome guy and you would never think Rick has a flaw in this movie. Like he, everybody loves Rick. All the girls are sleeping with him. All the right. guys wish they were him. Yeah. And it's, it's another thing like that you see in movies like in, in matrix, like everybody in matrix talks about Neo endlessly and so neo doesn't have to do shit like they're they're, they're all yeah. just like you are the one you are this you are that you are that and all he has to do is go whoa you know like he, he doesn't <laughs> right. have to do anything to be awesome and in casablanca all everybody does is show you how cool rick is before you meet rick they're like you used to run guns for the spanish the other side would have paid you better and, and like like the girl rick where were you last night? Like everybody is like throwing themselves over him. So he doesn't even really have to talk. Like he just right. has to stand there. Like it's so perfectly achieved. Like, and then you find out why he's a wreck. You find out why he, they're in the middle of world war two and he's not committing to one side or the other. And you, the girl walks in and you're like, Oh, he's got a broken heart. And it, it just, yep. it perfectly fixes itself. And it's, it's just such a wonderful, wonderful it's screenwriting theory actually working, you know, it, it really is totally formula in every single bit it hits just knocks it out of the park. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he, I mean, he's, yeah, he's essentially kind of 
uh, anti-hero, I guess you could call him. I mean, he's, you know, like, like, like you said, yeah, he doesn't have to say anything. He's just there. People respect him. But yeah, you can tell just how cynical he is and just like he just like like i said doesn't stick his neck out for nobody and you know it's um yeah and yeah just the way this man who seems so strong and so uh you know this this leading guy and you know there's nothing nothing can take him down and yet it's a a woman leaving him uh, on a train that's that's made him who he is you know and it's- and it's amazing, and, and like it, it's something that you, I think you could just watch and enjoy, but the more <clears throat> you know about and the more you've seen Humphrey Bogart movies, the more it resonates. Yeah. And I know this is a lame comparison, but like I think one of the reasons that everybody loves Robert Downey Jr.'s performance as Tony Stark is because there's a bit, he's playing himself to a certain extent. Like this Robert yeah. Downey Jr. was this total train wreck guy and now suddenly he like found a noble cause and he's not a train wreck anymore. Like, and, and Bogey at the beginning of Casablanca is playing Bogey from every single movie before this. Like tough, badass, he'll shoot you, he doesn't care. He yeah. looks cool, like, and everybody loves him. And then you see him cry. You see him get drunk and cry. And you see that he fell in love, which you've never seen Bogey do either of those things. And right. then at the end of the movie, he's like this compassionate hero. And so you get to see him playing, Not I, probably it has nothing to do with the real Humphrey Bogart. Right. He was just an actor. But you get to see his persona go from the coolest guy in Hollywood to even cooler <laughs> because now he's got a heart. Like he's yeah. the Bogey guy we saw before. But now he's he's in love and yeah. he gave away his love for something bigger than himself. Like it's it's really remarkable how his yeah. he almost wasn't cast in that movie. It was gonna be Ronald Reagan, and Ronald Reagan wasn't available. <laughs> and like and so they, it's like Bogey was like the last minute guy. And it's yeah. it just like this crazy, crazy chance. But it just so plays into who he was as a character and how people perceive him as a character. And it works even if you don't know any of that. Right. You've, like, you know, but it's it's so yeah, cause you, and great. Cause- because yeah, you, like you said, it works even if you don't know any of that. Because you know, you you see him be this character, you get to know the character a little. But then to see him be vulnerable, it's like, oh, okay, this guy, you know, does have a heart <laughs> uh, that was then ripped out and you know stomped on <laughs> essentially. And you know, that's you know, it, it reminds me of uh, you know sometimes you know, people play you know sad songs just because they want to feel something or you know just remind them of a. a uh, time even if it hurts they want to they want to wallow in that and that's what happens with him when he plays as time goes by at first he's pissed that sam's playing that uh at ingrid ingrid's uh request uh but then uh then later on uh when the bar is closed he he says play it you know i want to i want to hear it you know and he's just drinking and, and listening and it's just like Wow, damn! This guy is going through it, you know, and it's and just... he plays a good drunk. Like what's yeah, what's it like like it's mostly in those old movies, especially drunks are either hilarious or they're like tragic, but they're not like a drunk. Like like he said, he drinks a whole fucking bottle of bourbon, and and he's and it's you believe that he I don't know if he did or not, but his performance in that scene as guy with his heart ripped out sitting by himself drinking a bottle of bourbon like it's you're like fuck like you totally believe him and then she comes in and they have that horrible drunk fight like it's just it's just so ahead of its time it feels very modern yeah in a a great way yeah yeah it's not like uh like you were saying earlier like a lot of old movies you know are just like it's like what what it's boring and you know it's it's but th- this movie is just yeah it's it's does stand the test of time as much as that phrase is overused but it does i mean it's uh, it's a movie you can watch now and still relate to and still you know uh appreciate um or empathize with him what he's going through and why he is what he is what what love can do to a person you know and uh, e- even in the time of war like this is a time where you know the the nazis can come in at any moment and he's stuck just 
heartbroken. And but the problems of two people don't amount to a hill of beans in this world. Like it's yes, just so fucking yeah. great. Like it's, and then like the other thing is everybody talks about the ending, but like that movie has like four or five scenes that if you're really paying attention, make you do the wave. They're so good. Like the, the, the scene play the Nazi is, where like the Nazis come in and start playing like a Nazi song. And, and Paul Henry says, play the Nazi is, and they play a different song and it overtakes the Nazis. And like the scene where like, like Claude Rains is trying to fuck this girl, like who's married and like, and, but he, if he fucks, if she will have sex with them, the, the, he'll let a, the, him and his her and her husband leave. And so Humphrey Bogart like lets her win the money to buy a letter of transit. And it's just like, oh my God, it, it's yeah. such a great scene. There, It's just like, like you, you establish the premise of that movie. And then the whole middle as, as, as bogey, just as one awesome scene after another, I'm going to let this girl win at poker. I'm going to yeah. let Paul Henry, let the band lead this song to overtake the Nazis, which immediately it's also a movie where the bad guys in that there's no sl- it doesn't take its time. Like as soon right. as 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 soon as Rick slightly says, I'm going to step my foot into this and say that the French can sing their song, even though the Nazis are singing, the Nazis shut his bar down yep. that minute. Like it, it's it doesn't. It, and that's it. The bar <laughs> never reopens again. Yeah, they so say it. it they say find a way, you know, to to close it, and then yeah, he. Uh, I'm shocked. He, he, shocked. He, he, yeah, gambling on your premises. Right. It's, it's and then, so good. And then he hands it. Here's your winning, sir. Uh, oh, thank you. It's, <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. Like, but it's it's just like Act Two of that movie is just like one after another. It's like the Matrix, where like after after he learns he's he's maybe the one every scene after that is just fucking amazing. It's just, yeah. like, Oh, he does that. Oh, he does that. Oh, he does that. And that's Rick in act two of Casablanca. It's right. so good. And, and, and I, it's funny. I, you know, I've seen this movie several times, obviously, and I watched it again for the show to prepare. And, uh, I, I, I guess I didn't ever put it together that, you know, he needed to sleep, sleep with some girls because he had, he's has a meeting in his office or whatever. And a guy comes in and he says, a visa problem came up again, sir. And he, uh, he says, show her in. Show her in. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's like, Oh, yeah, it's, it's like, like, man, an awful slot ball character. It's, so subtle though like so i think like for 1942 it's like they they could they could ease that in where it's like yeah exactly it's so (laughs) great yeah like it's it's also it's one of those movies that it was a lot of it was by accident like like people the the movie they were writing the movie and they didn't know the ending. It's very different from the play. Like the, 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 the play, it, it's, it's totally in the play. Rick is a lawyer and in the play, uh, Elsa isn't married when Rick and he are together. They changed a lot. Yeah. And like the, the, but like it's, there's great documentaries on the Blu-ray about the, the making of Casablanca. And one of them is just about the writing of Casablanca. And so okay. like the two guys who started it, the Epstein brothers, got pulled away to do a Frank Capra propaganda movie. And so like three other writers came through in the middle and wrote little bits and pieces of it. And then the Epstein brothers came back at the end and looked at the script and they were like, well, who the, who does she end up with? You know, they, yeah. they, they had to figure it out, which is neat. Like, I love the idea that, that movies have to be some genius mastermind with like this plan Right. It's, that's not always the case. You know, they, they, sometimes like Casablanca was just this weird fumbling forward and like the, the people changed casting and the director changed and they didn't know the ending until like they were already shooting. And so, yeah. the girl, you know, they like Bogey didn't know who was going to get the girl until like a couple of days before that scene, which is amazing. You know, well, like even- they, so she plays it like she's going to end up with either guy, you know, cause you don't, they didn't know, which is yeah. amazing. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. And it, it worked, uh, to, to their benefit, obviously, you know, for, for her to, you know, kind of act both ways, but in, in just character wise, I don't think Humphrey's character, you know, I don't think he necessarily knows what he's going to do until, you know, he, like he said, he did, he did a lot of thinking and, you know, you said it's up to me. So like I, his character, Rick, 
doesn't know, uh, I don't think, you know, what he's going to do until the last minute either. So that all, you know, that, that kind of goes together, which is fantastic. It's it's yeah. It's great. It's so <laughs> much fun. Yeah. There's, and there's so many, yeah, just little layers and yeah, the, obviously the famous lines that here, here, here's looking at you kid. We'll always have Paris, you know, it's just, and it's, it's not play it again, Sam, as, as, uh, commonly, uh, uh, misconstrued. Yep. Yeah. Play nobody it. ever it's says just, that. Yeah. Yep, exactly. So, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, if you, if you haven't seen it, like, uh, like Ben said, we got to, you know, you, you, you were supposed to pause it and then, uh, watch it and then come back to this episode. So it's your the, fault. The, and it's a great, if you're, if you're a screenwriter, it's a movie to study and study and study and study because because every plot twist in it, the structure of it is perfect. Like it's just it, it's it's like the perfect introduction of a main character. It's the perfect the of the the letters of transit are like the perfect device that launch you into the story. Yeah. Like like e- everything about it is is perfect and. The, the writers of it, the Epstein brothers, who started the movie and then ended the movie, they there's a, I think it's on the Blu-ray documentary, but those guys remember exactly where they came up with the ending. They, they like, they, they, they remember they were in their car driving home from the studio on Tahiti and they were trying to think of the end of the movie and they weren't even trying to think of which guy does she end up with. They were just like, how do we end this movie? And they both realize at the same time, round up the usual suspects. Like that, that's that's a great line at the end. So, okay, what does that mean? That means somebody has been murdered. Great. Who does the audience want to see murder? The Nazi. Great. Yep. We'll shoot the Nazi. Who do they want to murder him? Rick. Great. So that means Rick must still be there. That must mean that the girl leaves with Paul Henry. Like, but they but they put it together based around how great a last line, right up the usual suspects, would be at the end. And it really is. It's so cathartic yeah, it's, when you re- when that happens. You're just like, oh my god. Yeah. And so, but they they were just winging it. But they remember like there. It's like the 50 year documentary of the movie, and they remember exactly where they were on Doheny when they came up with the last line of Custom yeah. Rock, which is really cool. It's- it's insane what a masterpiece it became. The fact that they, they, you know, were kind of making it up on the spot, like you said, like, and it still ended up this cinematic masterpiece. And yeah, just so amazing. And uh, yeah, I love, yeah, when, uh, you know, he does, you know, obviously the whole, you know, we'll always have Paris, you'll regret it for the rest of your, not, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but, you know, for the rest of your life. Um, why, why do you think Rick ultimately lets her go? I think because he becomes a good person at the end, yeah. you know, like, like I think he goes from not caring to actually seeing the bigger picture, which is what he always used to do. And he, and he always talks about like they talk about in his past that he ran guns to the Spanish and the other side would have paid him better. So he's always been a mensch. Like he's always like he's always taken the shit end of the deal to do the right thing. Like it's established in his character that he fought losing resolutions for not much money that's yeah. what he does. And so he, yeah. he like he let the girl go because he knew that that was the right thing for this this time and place, which is which is pretty neat. Like they, they just establish he'll take a loss if it's for the right cause. And that's ultimately what he does at the end of the movie. Yeah. And it's not your, you know, your typical happily, you know, the couple lives happily, happily ever after, you know, it's not the guy ends up with the girl story, which is crazy for 1942, it seems, um, because, you know, that's the, the, you know, the popular ending and that's supposed to be the happy ending. But no, it was it was it was a noble ending. You know, it's it was him being a hero in that moment and making him one of the greatest heroes in movie history. You know, it's uh, yeah, it's just so, so brilliant. And I love the line when when he does all that and um, uh, Ingrid Bergam's husband says, uh, what does he say? He says, welcome yeah, back, back to the, the fight. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yep. This time I know, uh, our side will win because before they mentioned how, you know, uh, 
Bogart always picked the underdog and he said, this time I know our side will win. And it's just so like, you know, since chills down your spine a little, it's just like, And, and imagine yes. like being in the theater in like 1943 and we just entered World War II. Like, yep. you know, like, like just imagine like yeah. how that must have just been a sure, reassuring. And yes. Like, like seeing, so like seeing the Nazi get shot always feels great. It feels well, great yeah. in 20, you know, 2022. See the Nazi yes. get shot. And like, Woo-hoo! Like, but imagine <laughs> the catharsis of being in a movie theater in 1943 and seeing this awful Nazi who's such a dick the whole movie. And right. And the movie shoots up like, like that, like what a great feeling that must have been. And, and I guess they timed, they timed the, the, for me, it's so weird to think about this in terms of like headlines, but like it's the premiere was the weekend that we won, that that Patton won his first battle against Rommel in North Africa, and that's oh, okay. when they like released the movie. And yeah, then, like, the, and then Casablanca, they released it when there was some sort of Casablanca conference was in the oh, news with okay. us and Allied forces meeting in North Africa to talk about D Day before D Day, and so it's so odd. Like it seems like such a timeless movie. But at the time, the executives yeah. were like, "Wait a minute, let's 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 move it a weekend. Let's see if we let's see if Patton wins, and then let's yeah. release it." You know, like right. which is so weird. It's, it's yeah. fascinating to me. Yeah, the, I mean, yeah, you got so much going on in the movie. Then when the movie comes out, there's just so much going on in the world, and it's just, <laughs> man, the, the the timing of this movie is even perfect. It's just, yeah, so so great. Um, and then real quick, uh, uh, there were there's subtle comedy in this movie too. Uh, I love when the couple uh, is uh, preparing for to go to Ten America. Bunch. Ten bucks. <laughs> Ten bucks. Ten bucks. You do great in there. Like so so great. And like how how amazing, like you just Hollywood, like fucking Hollywood, we get it right sometimes. Like the, the Hollywood made a point of having German good guys in that movie. Like you know, like the like yeah. the, the people at the table were German, and, and the waiter right. is German, and so they very carefully were like, eh, we're not the Nazis yes. bad Germany. Right, let's be nice to some Nazi immigrants here." You know that which is fascinating and and so smart like you would yeah. you know, that, that that subtlety yeah. there's another thing about the end scene and i'll say this you can't unsee it after you after i tell you this but there's some documentary the the scene at the end where they're loading the plane where he says you're getting on that plane and he's talking to him the they, they shot that in a sound stage in burbank and so the plane is in the real plane it's a little tiny plane it's only about like four feet tall and about like seven feet long because it's inside a big black sound stage, right? And oh. so, if you, and if you look, they, they like I like think Michael I remember, Ortiz is yeah. looking at it and is like, "This is so dead. Like we need people back there." And so he put people back there in luggage, but the people were taller than the plane, and so he hired little people. Oh are, so, man! So if you look, it's it's little people. It's adults who are four foot tall with yeah. little tiny baggage loading little tiny baggage into a little tiny plane and oh, after you man. after you know that and look at it you're like oh my god like so he <laughs> borrowed some of the munchkins from from wizard of oz that had wrapped a couple of years earlier wow and like, it's, so it's those are munchkins those yeah. are those are studio little people and man. after you see it once you're like how did I not see that? Like, how did I not recognize that before? Yeah, because I remember hearing something about the plane, yeah, being different. But yeah, the little people, I, I, I don't think I've heard that. That's, wow, I'm going to have to look at you that. You can't, uh, un- after you see it, it's like, oh, yeah. how did I not <laughs> yeah, notice how- <laughs> that? That's fascinating. <laughs> and then obviously, yeah, you get the whole, you know, the famous, you know, I think this is the start of a beautiful, beautiful friendship and all that. Yeah, again, iconic lines, iconic timing of the movie. It's just, yeah, just such a, yeah, how, how you can watch it in 2022 and still just, you know, just fully appreciate. Yeah, what is this? What, 80 years? 80 years now? That's 80, 81. Yeah, like, 81 uh, years. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. a movie that, like, if, if, if you're a young person, like you, you, it's worth it to sit down and almost, I mean, it's from such a different era that it's almost like watching a foreign movie. Like if you watch, if you watch right. Parasite, you get used to it. Like the, there's subtitles, it's yeah. a slightly different performance style. 
and you just have to kind of get used to it. So sure. it's worth sitting down. Yes, it's in black and white. Yes, it's all interiors, you know, which is weird. That it's a movie set in Casablanca, and there's so many big dramatic scenes you don't see. Like today, you would see Peter Lorre murdering the two Germans and stealing the letter of transit. And right. today, you would see the scene where Paul Henry gets shot at like the secret underground meeting, but it, they couldn't do that. It's all inside of this cafe. And so you yep. have to like appreciate it almost like a play, but Jesus, like if you, if you can look at it with that filter, the performances are modern. The writing is modern. It's just, it's so fucking entertaining. It's, yeah. it's just great. Like a lot of classic movies have real issues and real problems and it just, doesn't you know yeah definitely yeah so yeah uh, amazing yeah it's uh i mean everything that uh, you can say about this movie has been said already but it's just great to break it down i've uh, yeah i'm so glad this is the first time we've done it on the show and and yeah i'm so glad you picked it did you have any final thoughts on it that uh, we didn't mention yeah i mean it's it's a movie what's what's also fascinating if you're a screenwriter it's a movie to study. And if you're Hollywood, like it's, it's a, it's in the middle of the studio system, which is fascinating. Like, so, so they were cranking out like 30, like I think they shot this thing in like two fucking weeks, like, and they were just cranking out movies. And so like literally the cast would be like, what am I in this week? Oh, I'm a waiter in, in Casablanca. Okay. Yeah. And like Sydney green street would finish one movie. Be like, what am I? Oh, I've only got two scenes in Casablanca. Great. You know, and so it's it's all these studio contract players who didn't have a say in what they were going to do. And so this movie has like like Claude Rains is the lead in almost every movie he's in. And in this right. in this one, he's this creepy little like like nefarious yep. thief guy. And so you get to see these great, great actors pouring everything they can into just like three scenes of a movie yeah, and, and it's this weird, awesome chemistry that makes every scene of it just great. Like you're watching such professionals and like, I, I don't know where I saw this, but I know Richard Dreyfus, the actor as an yeah. actor talked about how he studied Casablanca because the way that they would, if you look at that movie, people don't move. Like the, the way that the scenes are lit, like the way that the scenes are these big giant lights. Did I lose you again? Wait, uh, let me see if I'm getting a spam call. Oh. <laughs> there you go. Like I've heard, I, I this isn't. I didn't make this observation, but I've heard Richard Dreyfus talk about studying that movie as an actor because people in that those scenes don't move. They the the way that it's lit with a big giant camera and all these huge massive lights, like they they're just locked. Like 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 Bogart will have an entire dramatic scene and they'll sit there. But if you look at right. him, like he doesn't fucking move. Like and, and like and Ingrid Bergman and they'll have these huge dramatic scenes. And people don't move. And it's fascinating. And, and if you look at the performances and everything with what they had to do technically just to get it on film, it's fascinating what they can is, do. Is that because they had such little time to do it that they couldn't keep adjusting the lighting and stuff? Like is is Well, if you if you look like it, like if you look at any scene Ingrid Bergman is in in that and she has a big light behind her and then another light shining in her hair and a light right on her. Yeah. Eyes. It's yeah. And if you look at photos, the lights are like these 300 pound monstrosities. Like, and they say that on sets back then it would be like 110 degrees just because these massive, massive lights are like pelting down on everyone. And so everything is lit so precisely that people hit their mark. And if they move their shoulder this way, it ruins the light. Like it, it's okay. It's yeah. Fascinating. Man. Like, and, and it's just, just what they would do back then. And like, which makes you appreciate it even more just when you look at what they, they had to do just to get it on film back then, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure it reminds you of the set of Reno 911. 
super precise, super yeah. precise. When yeah. I pretend to get my dick caught in a birdhouse, it lights. We light that scene for like twelve hours. You know, yeah. like it, it takes like twelve hours, and then you know another four hours for me to get into character of well, the guy whose dick is caught in a birdhouse. You know, like it's you have yeah. You have to be emotionally we prepared. For our art. That's what exactly. we do. Exactly. That's it's, it's, yeah, it's just a great, it's a great read, read the Wikipedia page on North Africa, world war II, 1941, watch the movie. It's, it, it's just, it yeah. just holds up. It's a, it's a classic that is genuinely a roller coaster ride of entertainment. It's so yeah. much fun. Uh, yeah, I just really, yeah, yeah, I'm looking at Claude Rains' uh, uh, filmography. He was in Lawrence of Arabia. Um, he's the Invisible oh, Man. The, he's the, the, oh, yeah, the Invisible you know, Man. The invisible man but he's the Invisible Man, yeah. Yeah, he's invisible. So that's why we, oh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. He was in that. Um, he was yeah. a contract player. He was in just like everything. He usually yeah. plays a bad guy. He usually plays a bad guy who turns good or a good guy who turns bad. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, man, great choice. I mean, yeah, I could go on and on. I'm sure you could too about this film. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, really appreciate you you coming on, discussing with it, with me. So again, when, uh, when, when's the season of Reno 911 come out, the new one? Reno 911, a brand new season, 11 full length episodes, reuniting the entire original cast starts February 25th. They're great. There's they're as good arenas as we've ever done. Uh, yeah. QAnon, I like QAnon. I think we are more at our element when we are on the beat as cops in Reno. This shows yeah. it's great. I think people are really going to like it. I'm excited for people to see it. It's been in the can for a year, so I'm excited for people to finally see it. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I can't wait. To, can't wait to check it out. Uh, are, do you, are you on social media at all where people can follow you or... Yeah, good. Good for you. Not at uh, all. Don't blame me. I use my you. computer to write. Don't get high on your own supply. Yeah, it's my motto. My motto. But I have to promote the show, so I have to be on Twitter, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, yeah. But, uh, and then real quick, uh, so uh, you, it's Robert Ben, but you go by Ben, right? Uh, yeah, I go by Ben. Yeah, I was yeah. named after a, a, an uncle, and they just called me Ben growing up. So I didn't, okay. I didn't have a so, choice. So I, I grew yeah. up Ben. You grew up Ben. And are you offended when people call you Robert? People call me Bob. People call me RB. Uh, my RB. mother calls me Robert Benjamin. So I, I don't care. I know who you're talking about. Okay. Well, th- that's that's what counts. Well, man, it's been an absolute blast. Uh, again, you've brought me many, uh, much joy over the years. So I really appreciate it. Uh, it's been an honor for me. So thank you so much uh, for coming on. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. I like your show. It's good. I listen to the Matt Walsh win. That was delightful. Talking about Blade yeah, he's yeah. a great guy. Matt Max oh, is he's like one he's of awesome. Yeah, he's he's great. Um, uh, yeah, that's funny. We, we got disconnected. His on his show is uh, I kicked like my cord underneath and we lost him um and uh but yeah he was nice enough to send a clip to wrap up the show and you know so it all he's it very, all worked he's out very in the good end. people like that, yeah. that was a great episode too I, I, that's really <laughs> like that blade runner is a movie you could talk about for oh ages yeah and ages as well. absolutely that was, that was a fun listen that was good. yeah but, uh, but yeah, man, uh, if you ever want to uh, come on again, I get, can tell you're just pa- passionate about film. So if you ever are, are in the urge to talk about uh, movies, uh, we'll, we'll reach out. You reach out, you know, whatever you want to do. So I'd, I'd but, love uh, to. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, man. Absolutely. All right. Well, I won't keep you any longer. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a good rest of your day. Good rest of your week. And uh, good luck on the new season. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, man.